Uh, and, um, the, uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the president of the Freedom Association, Christopher Gill. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to preface my remarks by saying a very big thank you to Simon Richards and Dear and Rory for having organized this splendid occasion for us. Yeah. And, and this is if by way of being a little bit of a trial run because we intend to repeat this exercise next year and more particularly in 2015 when we will be celebrating the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. I'm particularly honored to be asked to make this address to you this afternoon because in 1994 that address was made by the Right Honorable Enoch Powell and I had the pleasure of being a constituent of Enoch Powell's for very many years. And I saw him shortly before he died, and I shall remember to my dying day what he said on that occasion. He gave me three pieces of advice. He said, Christopher, what we have to do is to repeal the Treaty of Accession. But he then went on to say he didn't think that in his lifetime opinion would have changed so much against the European Union. And the third thing he said to me, and this is what sustains me in my political life, is Christopher, he said, never forget, the people will win. And we will, with your support. You will hardly be surprised when I tell you that the text for what I have to say this afternoon is that single word, freedom. But before developing that theme, I want to pay tribute to those two Prime Ministers who, in my lifetime, truly understood the meaning of that crucial word. I refer, of course, in the first instance to Sir Winston Churchill, who, against all the not inconsiderable odds stacked against him, united the then British Empire in the armed struggle against the Axis forces of terror and tyranny. As a child, I lived through the Second World War. Night after night, we slept under the dining room table or in the neighbor's air raid shelter. And as the bombs rained down and the bullets flew, people of my generation knew that freedom was truly on the line. In the second instance, as some of you may already guessed, I want to pay tribute to the late lamented Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. She unswervingly stood up for freedom. She instinctively knew that there was no third way between freedom and tyranny. And as we all know, it was her declaration of opposition to EU-imposed tyranny in her famous Bruges speech which provoked the forces of darkness within the Conservative Party to engineer her defenestration. But before that appalling act of treachery and betrayal, it was the Western world's great good fortune that in cahoots with the American President Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher stood up to Soviet Russia and effectively ended the Cold War. She understood better than most that the way to deal with bullies is to stand up to them. Just as she stood up to the bullies in the trade union movement and with the help of the Freedom Association banished the iniquitous closed shop. To quote the Iron Lady, a man's right to work as he will, to spend what he earns, to own property, to have the state as servant and not as masters, these are the British inheritance. Mm. <laughs> they are the essence of a free economy, and on that freedom, all other freedoms depend. Those words of Margaret Thatcher encapsulate some of the most important fundamental human rights. The right to act, to speak, and to think freely, and to be master of one's own fate the origins of which go right back to the Magna Carta sealed on this spot 
by King John on this day in 1215. On line 40 of that historic document, as translated from the original Latin, it is stated that no free man shall be taken, imprisoned, outlawed, banished, or in any way destroyed, nor will we proceed against or prosecute him except by the lawful judgment of his equals and by the law of the land. That sentence, together with the sentences either side of it, have been the bedrock of British justice for far longer than most other countries have existed. In the words of the late Lord Denning, Magna Carta is the greatest constitutional document of all times. The foundations of the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot. And Simon in his introductory remarks referred to the President of India and I would invite all of you to go and read the inscription under the oak tree over there where the Indian Prime Minister in 1994 said that Magna Carta was, I quote, a source of inspiration throughout the world and an affirmation of the value of freedom, democracy and the rule of law. Throughout history, even to the present day, the spectre of despots, dictators, oppressors, call tyrants what you will, is ever present. The all too common hallmark of their generally evil regimes is invariably that of false accusation, arbitrary arrest and wrongful imprisonment. And to the lasting shame of our own British Parliament, the passing into law of the European Arrest Warrant by dint of the Extradition Act 2003 rendered British subjects powerless to resist that same spectre of false accusation, arbitrary arrest and wrongful imprisonment from which we had hitherto for been so adequately protected. Plunging us back into aspects of the criminal justice of the Dark Ages, the government of the day argued that there was an equivalence between British common law and continental law which simply did not exist then and still doesn't exist now. With the exception of Malta and the Republic of Ireland, the law of habeas corpus and the crucial right of trial by jury are virtually unknown in the rest of the European Union. East of Dover, the onus is upon defendants to prove their innocence which is, of course, in stark contrast to the British criminal justice system, which requires the prosecution to establish guilt. And there's a world of difference in those two systems. In my lifetime, at the hands of murderous dictators and deranged despots, millions and millions of innocent people were consigned to concentration camps and labor camps where their almost inevitable fate that awaited them was death in unspeakably vile conditions. Our own Vice President, Vladimir Vygotsky, has personal experience of life in the Gulag. But listen to the proverb quoted by another Russian dissident, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, quotes the uh, a proverb, freedom spoils, lack of freedom teaches. And we, ladies and gentlemen, who've enjoyed freedom so long that we take it for granted, have been spoiled. And as if to underscore that point, what an irony it is, as Simon has already said, that this memorial to Magna Carta, which now stands in the meadow of Runnymede, was commissioned by the American Bar Association rather than by the British themselves, who effectively invented freedom. As to the lack of freedom teaching, if the EU ratchet is allowed to grind inexorably onwards and snuffs out the criminal justice system which has so long protected us against state coercion, we shall learn a lesson the likes of which scarcely bears thinking about. I therefore beg the present generation of parliamentarians to stand fir firm against the surrender of British common law defending the freedom of the individual against coercion by the state is their single most important 
fundamental duty and responsibility. To paraphrase the immortal words of Admiral Lord Nelson, England expects, and for its part, ladies and gentlemen, the Freedom Association expects every member of the Westminster Parliament in whom the instruments of freedom and democracy are entrusted to earn the gratitude and respect of all the people they represent by ensuring the continuance of British common law or forever to be hold, held in utter contempt. You will do that. <laughs>